Don't be frightened. It's just you and me. Does what scared you as a kid scare you now? I mean, besides loud noises, things out of the corner of your eye, you know, the basic evolutionary stuff. I assembled a coven of film comment contributors, Michael Koreski, Ina Archer, and Margaret Barton Fumo, and asked each of them to pick three films to talk about. First, a movie that scared them as a child. Second, a horror film that they feel is especially well made. And finally, a movie that scares them now as an adult. There are some spoilerish details given about Lucio Fulci's The Beyond, Dan Curtis's Trilogy of Terror, and a segment in George Romero's Creep Show. So if you haven't seen those films and want optimal scares, just fast forward. Hello and welcome to the Film Comet Podcast. My name's Violet Luca, and today I am joined by... Michael Koreski. I'm the editorial director here at the Film Society of Lincoln Center. Margaret Barton Fumo, a longtime contributor to Film Comment and a columnist for Deep Cuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ina Archer, um, I'm a student in NYU's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program and a contributor to the magazine. Thank you all for coming on this especially f- spooky morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about things that have scared us at different points in our lives, things that um, may or may not be horror movies, and different concepts of what is frightening, what is actually scary, um, and how you create that sense of terror. So um, <laughs> so I've asked everyone to come with three films. A film that scared them as a child, which could be horror or not, a horror film that they appreciate and they feel is especially well made, and a a third movie, a film that scares them as an adult, and it could also be horror or not horror. So, Michael, maybe we could start with you. The movie that I selected as the movie that scared me as a child, and that doesn't mean that it doesn't scare me now, right? But <laughs> um, you know, it's it's interesting what scares you as a child. So that I thought that was a good question, Violet. Um, it's the picture of Dorian Gray, the 1945 Albert Lewin Hollywood version. I just happened to have been watching it from an early age because my mother's a big fan of it. And it's interesting because I saw it before ever reading the book. And the picture drawing grade, the Oscar Wilde novel, isn't necessarily horror, even though there are obviously supernatural elements. It's about this picture that ages while the hero or anti-hero, this narcissist figure, Dorian Gray, um, doesn't age. So it does have the supernatural element. But the book is, is... more of a morality tale and um but watching the movie which was sort which was an mgm film and it was marketed as more of like a monster movie in a sense (laughs) um you you really get you it brings out the inherent horror of the situation in in a lot of different ways i mean the prime way has everybody have you seen the film the prime way is with the actual picture itself And it's really funny. I was just Who's reading the, the artist, Ivan Albright. Yes, and that a great uh, American artist. Yes, his, which um, is at the Chicago Institute of Art. It is the the, the actual picture drawing Gray is there, um, and I'll come back to that in a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's fine because I have a, an anecdote about that. But um, and I was just reading a little bit about Parker Tyler's response to picture drawing Gray in David Boardwell's new book, The Rhapsodes, mm-hmm. in which he was the big defender, the great critic Parker Tyler was the great defender of the film, even back then. So a lot of the critique around the film was that it was too too horror-like, actually, and that it relied on too many shock tactics. And the biggest shock tactic is that you have this, a shock cut to the painting after many years have gone by, to color. It's a black and white film. It's a beautifully, beautifully shot, Oscar-winning cinematography, black and white film. Harry Stradling shot it. And... So it cuts to full technicolor of the painting that you haven't seen in years, at that point, probably decades, and it's mangled, and there's blood on it, and he's aged and horrible and disgusting. But there's no real buildup to it, except for one tiny moment where you see a slight sneer after, after Dorian has done a particularly nasty deed. <laughs> um, and and the crit- criticism was that this is too, this is vulgar, this is crass. You can't just do a shot cut to this face. And... It's actually one of the most amazing things about the movie, and it, mm-hmm. and it's and it's one of the few true shot cuts that I can remember from early Hollywood, not early Hollywood, but the golden age of Hollywood. And I've never 
gotten over that. <laughs> so see, that, that shot cut to a face has stayed with me forever. And it kind of has been done many times since, to a certain extent. I mean, one of the scariest things about a horror movie for me is just a face and how that face is, it, it kind of becomes its own um, horror device, right? It could Absolutely. be a human face. It can yeah. be, I mean, I don't know if you've seen like Mario Bava's The Drop of Water, but it's, it's basically a, a telltale heart adaptation, but it's all about um, this man who steals a ring from a corpse and she keeps coming back and it just keeps showing her face over and over again. And it's <laughs> one of the scariest things ever. Or Salem's Lot, the, the, seven, the TV version from 78, that terrible vampire face that just pops out of the dark and d disappears again. Or the face from The Exorcist. Or the face from The Exorcist. Which is like, I know so many people who all find that film scary for that face, but also um, the horrific medical task Reagan undergoes yeah. to figure out what is wrong with her. Like, I, even as an adult, oh, it's like terrible. so creepy. Well, the story about that is that, you know, all the, uh, like, almost the mythical tales of people, like, passing out in, in yes. the theater about The Exorcist. It really wasn't, like, the vomiting. It was the medical stuff. Yeah. And understandably, you're watching her get a tracheotomy. <laughs> yeah. Who wouldn't pass out at that? Yeah. But yeah, I had so another face that came to mind was Mr. Sardonicus. Oh yeah. my God! Uh, which is you know <laughs> the horrible. rictus face and that and, you know, that the, wide, the, wide rictus. The, yeah, and it and it actually takes a while for the, for the movie to show, show that, that face because yeah. he's he's covered up. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mr. Sardonicus. <laughs> so no, I think it's interesting how the simplest technique like that um, is really the scariest. There's, it doesn't require that much in terms of effects. It's really just. Um, it's the most elemental thing there is. So anyway, the picture of Dorian Gray, and for many reasons other than that, I think that it, it's, an ama it's an amazing mood piece. The mat work is incredible. Mm -hmm. Herd Hatfield, who plays Dorian Gray, gives one of the strangest performances <laughs> ever in the history of American <laughs> movies. It's like he's not even there. It, it's the most recessive, strange, ghost-like performance. It's really not Dor even Dorian Gray is written. It's a completely different yeah. thing. And so even he scared me. I mean, I, I, this movie gave me nightmares. That's all I can say. <laughs> I need to watch it again now. I, it's making me want to see it yeah. again. I had another question about Dorian Gray, or maybe we can come back to sure. it. But there, um, Herd Hatfield, who should probably be in Carnival of Souls, who yes. is going to come mm -hmm. up because he's so opaque and weird. But the painting that you're talking about that's in the museum, is that the, the, the picture of him as a young Dorian Gray? No, the oh, one that they okay. have in the museum is the one that is mangled and horrifying and covered in blood, and it's it, it was almost like the world is swirling around mm -hmm. this right, aged right. figure. And um, I had my own shot cut in my life to that painting because I didn't know it was at the Chicago Institute. And the first time I ever <laughs> went there, it's right across from Nighthawks. Oh, yeah. And I went there, and I'm looking at Nighthawks, and I'm so, you know overwhelmed by the fact that it's there and so excited <laughs> to see it. And I turn around to beckon to my husband. I was like, look what they have. And I turn around <laughs> and right behind it on the wall is the gigantic Dorian Gray painting that has been haunting me since <gasps> childhood. <laughs> and I almost screamed in person. <laughs> I think I did scream. Superb. <laughs> but go ahead, Ina. Oh. Can you say what your childhood film was? Well, Dorian Gray was one that would come up, and Ten Little Indians and other of those kind of films. But the, well, I'll talk about it in a second, but just the thing that probably scared me the most in the horror realm was the opening of Monster Chiller Theater on uh, <laughs> Channel 5. It was this disembodied hand, a claymation hand that sent me into such a panic. That it, I, and that came on at like every day too, so <laughs> I had to really avoid about 4.30 in the afternoon because of this terrible show open. And initially when, when I was thinking about this, I was going to choose the movie Frogs, but I realized I've never seen Frogs, not until I was an adult, but I remember being terrified by the poster with this frog with a giant you know, human-sized hand in its mouth and just the, you know, and having a lifelong terror of frogs ever since. Um, but I have a similar memory with, I, and I still don't know, I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's Boa. It's oh. some, some sort of snake film, and I'm still terrified of snakes, <laughs> but it's just an image that I must have just happened upon, like on a television or something, of a giant, <laughs> giant <laughs> boa constricting to, like, children. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Why would that scare you? Yeah. 
but it, it's another, you know, creepy <laughs> reptile yeah. memory. <laughs> I'm sure there's like tons of animal <laughs> based oh, yeah. films, but the one that I chose, which actually would be like a not a child, but a teen age film is a trilogy of terror yes. um, oh, from <laughs> and I had to kind of go back to it again last night. But the Karen Black three part film is directed by Dan Curtis in 75. And I think just the fact that it came on on television made it extra super scary and and that everybody kind of shared the the scares and I was kind of forbidden to watch horror so the fact that it came on on television and I watched it on the sly I think added to the the sense of it being even more terrifying the first two episodes I don't remember very well They're or kind of a snooze. Dude, yeah <laughs> there's one about evil twins yeah evil twins and, another and about the, date rape date rape yeah, exactly the, the roofing yeah. <laughs> yeah. so and then you know overall looking at it again I think oh everything to do with women kind of branching out or you know uh, sort of taking on their own sexuality is is taken on and punished but kind of not in the film and sort of ending up... Um, or shown as evil. Or shown, evil. Yeah. yeah. And the last one, of course, with this little uh, doll yes. <laughs> with him when his bling falls off and he's <laughs> it's like... And she comes Unleashed. back. <laughs> and, you know, and she's supposed to... You know, now I know that she's supposed to go on a date and she doesn't go on the date because her mother, she's being harassed by her mother. Not harassed, or she, her obligation to being with her mother causes her to break her date and that also unleashes a kind of monster but all I recall was both being horrified kind of clinging to the tv watching it in black and white I think because we had only had a black and white tv on in the kitchen counter like two inches away from it and you know laughing and screaming at the same time but then of course when it was time to go to bed that's when it was. <laughs> really, all the dolls were suspect. Every toy in the room. Yeah. This was an actually like a particularly strange doll. Right? Yeah, well, is, it's like a strange racially coded. Yeah, thing. with his yeah. his. Um, I'm trying to remember what he was supposed Zuni. to be. Zuni. Azuni, that's right. Yes. A Zuni fetish doll. Yes. <laughs> with the spirit Your of little Zuni war yeah. trapped inside of yeah. Well, the, and the teeth. Because that's the yeah, marker. Little, yeah. That's how you know that. Well, also, I mean, the the final shot is so excellent. Yeah. And I just because I had never seen it before, so I watched it last night. Ah, uh, okay. And I just, I actually, I tried watching the first two episodes. I just skipped to the third one because mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, the money. I <laughs> skipped to the good one, and it was. Yeah. <laughs> what? Well, I was, before you, I was saying spoiler alert. Before before you say talk about that last shot because that's that's yes. talk about the money shot. You yeah. can insert a spoiler alert. No, the final shot where it's like she because she's just squatting and like with the knife just putting it into the carpet and then you see her mouth up. She got all these teeth. That was so great. really shock. You know the face. That's the shock. Um, it's a slow shock, but it, yeah. it comes in. But. Yeah, that, the, the, the little sound throw. that the dog ma the, the dog the, the doll makes is the also <laughs> yeah. <it's so> <laughs> <crazy>. <laughs> I love creepy dolls. I mean, I just love them. I would love to have a shelf of creepy dolls like, in my apartment. But I could see if I had seen that as a child, I would have just been traumatized. I mean, absolutely traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was, I saw it as a child. My parents showed it to me for some reason. Oh. You should watch this. It's really fun. <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're going with it. It is, you're right. It's a laughing, screaming thing, which is true of so much horror. But in that case, that last shot canceled out all the laughs. I think yeah. especially if you're a kid, it's almost, there's like no turning back at that point. Mm -hmm. You can, you can kind of laugh off a little doll with a spear running around, going to the oven, going under a pillow, going under the couch. <laughs> but when it turns into this human transformation mm -hmm. thing and what that implies. Yeah. It was pretty shocking. Yeah, her, I thought that she called her mother and that she was going to set up her mother to have the doll, unleash the doll on her mother. And then you see that zooms in on her and the teeth come out and you see that she's actually possessed by the demon. Yeah, yeah after she throws him in the oven. Sad, yeah. 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 And it, it is kind of sad at the end. Yeah, yeah it, that is a little, it doesn't leave you, yeah, it doesn't leave you laughing and it's kind of uh, that d disturbing part of it didn't take the fun out of it but then looking back it's very violent and mm -hmm. and then you kind of think about like how violent she's 
going to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. No, I mean, because she gives her performance, I think, through, I mean, through the, first she plays like a nebbish, then mm-hmm. she plays like this sexually repressed, like religious sort of a person. And then in the third one, she's also super repressed and like very like, oh, hello, mother. Oh. <laughs> and like no one from ever, no one from New York you would ever meet. Like she's just like so like nimby pamby. And then it's why it is sort of disturbing and that she's like possessed and she's going to do something that she really doesn't want to do. Like ultimately, and that's like, ugh, it's sort of icky and scary. But also horror films, and this goes back to like EC comics, like horror films have such a weird twisted complicated relationship with the idea of revenge yes and what revenge is and yes. what is satisfying and what isn't i mean that was what i also like about the movie creep show which yes. was a, a throwback the romero stephen king throwback to the ec comedy Loved. films they're all about getting revenge on someone who uh, sort of deserves what's coming mm-hmm. to them but that the revenge is always so outsized and grotesque that you can't feel good but, about it but the second one the second one isn't about revenge it's like where where stephen king oh, plays the, one the, with the, <laughs> the the like the corn the corn pone idiot jordy <laughs> verrill that's one of the <laughs> funniest movie performances of all time stephen king's oh, performance no. in that <laughs> oh like, my god i love it and you're right he doesn't top. deserve it he doesn't, he's an idiot. Like, you could think for a moment maybe he sort of deserves it because he thinks he's going to get rich off of selling this asteroid, but like, <laughs> whatever. Just to clarify for listeners, what we're talking about <laughs> is a meteor crashes in the backyard of Stephen, this character played by Stephen King. Who's an overall, overall wearing, like, idiot. <laughs> he wears overalls, yes. And he, touches, he yeah. touches the asteroid and moss starts to grow on his fingers and then it yeah. spreads to his whole body and turns basically into a big weed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's going to spread all over the planet, basically. Right. He's unleashed this biological terror. But anyway, yeah. He, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Segway. How do you follow Moving that? on. <laughs> um, all of my memories of what scared me as a child are fragments. You know, I don't know if it's because my brain wasn't ready to comprehend, you know, complex ideas or not, but it's just ha- what sticks in our minds. So the film that I picked is Goonies. I was ah, just yes. terrified of Goonies, it, but very particularly, I mean, of course, Sloth, but mainly the, the, the mother. I was just terrified of the mother, and I just have this image in my head of her with brandishing a knife, and she, this is the woman who had her moment at the time she was also throw mama from the train. Anne Ramsey. Yes, Anne Ramsey. The Thank you, Michael. Age of Anne Ramsey. Thank you. <laughs> Playing all and, sorts of uh, overbearing moms. <laughs> she she just terrified me and then as a little bit older as is 12, 13 when I started watching horror films with a friend of mine. I distinctly remember uh Night of the Demons, I think it was, and there's this just this one scene in it where uh Linnea Quigley becomes a demon and she takes her lipstick and she pushes her lipstick into her nipple. And that just, oh, it just it touched something, you know, within me that was just, it just scared me. What was she trying to do? She was just, because they turn to demons and they just do crazy shit. You know, oh. they just do like weird stuff. Okay. And then I saw, <laughs> I saw the I get dangerous now. stuff. I saw the film again not too long ago, and, and that particular scene, I mean, it just looks like clay. It looks like claymation or something, but it still is disturbing, though. It's a very disturbing image, and that stuck with me for years and years and years. And watching the film again, I didn't remember anything else in the film either. It was just that. Yeah. It's funny how fragments stick with you. Yeah, because, I mean, apparently the story in the, my family is that I saw a, a piece of Doctor Who one night because my parents were out, and the babysitter was over, And she let me watch Doctor Who, which doesn't seem like it would be much. Mm -hmm. But there's a scene where somebody's looking in the mirror and his eyes glow green. Mm -hmm. And that put me over the edge. Like, I had nightmares for weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody's eyes were glowing. Mm -hmm. It's just just when something's uncanny or out of of the normal. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I think that sort of ties into the film that scared me when I was a teen, which was heavy metal which is <laughs> sounds absurd because it's an it's a anthology film based on the long running fantasy magazine and for those who don't know uh, heavy metal was basically the gold standard for horny nerds <laughs> for a very for a very very long time and so they're like these sto- the other stories are like some guy gets transported to this magical realm and he like becomes a conqueror and he gets this woman with like giant boobs and he mm-hmm. kills lizard creatures. Mm-hmm. And then there's this other story, which is the one that scared the hell out of me, which is about um, this guy who's like a World War II fighter pilot 
but it's in space. Mm -hmm. And he's very valiantly with his fellows trying to defend and like they're getting shot at and all of his fellow crew members die. And then they come back as zombies. Mm. And the way that it's animated, because the whole film is animated, it's very sort of slow and creepy. And there's nowhere to go because not only is he in a plane, he's in space, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the vacuum of space. Mm -hmm. And then finally he crashes his plane. He thinks on this planet that has a breathable atmosphere and it's full of zombies. Mm -hmm. And it scared me so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think what scared me was not just that it was zombies or that there was no escape, but that just the slowness. And that's something that I feel sort of extends to the film that scares me as an adult, but we can come back to that later. Just this idea in horror sometimes where instead of, you know, we have the shock cut, something that just pops out of nowhere, mm -hmm. a sound that comes out of nowhere that's a little too loud, but then also things that are like really just way too slow and you see way too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but on that note of technical note, maybe we could switch to uh, films that we feel are especially well-made. Well, I kind of, I, I cheated and I picked two because the one that's just hands down clearly just I think is a stunning film is Daughters of Darkness. Yeah. And I'm just very partial in general to to the 70s European Euro pudding, mm -hmm. horrors, giallos, all of those. And part of it is because even if they, you can tell the production didn't have too much money, they often make use of the beautiful like European architecture you know, Jean Roland films, you always have like castles and chateaus and things like that. And uh, Daughters of Darkness is this gorgeous old hotel in Belgium. And then a lot of the look to it is just gels, like light gels, mm -hmm. you know, different colors. And I'm a sucker for that, just total sucker for that. And the costumes and everything. The, so the other one that I picked, though, that I just have a deep fondness for is called The Perfume of the Lady in Black. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's a giallo. It's considered a giallo. It's not a black glove killer giallo, but it's an Italian film that makes no sense. So it's a <laughs> giallo. And it stars uh, Mimsy Farmer as a scientist who basically is just haunted, really, by the ghost of her mother. She had a, a, a bad childhood, and she just slowly starts to lose her mind. It's one of those films, and her performance is great. And yeah, she lives in a beautiful old building, apartment building, and just the colors, the set design, the way it's shot is really nice. She often wears these like monochrome suits, it's different outfits, and she's very pale and she wears like a like a very pale kind of lavender lipstick to make it even make her look even more pale. And then at the very end of the film, it's suddenly like the last two minutes of the film just careens into a different genre and I'm not going to spoil that oh. but it just it, it's just shocking and sad and watching it again I see that you can kind of sort of see it coming if you actually pay attention to what characters are saying in this one scene which I did in the first time but you still are not going to guess like what happens it's just very shocking and I think it's a beautiful film with beautiful music too those uh 70s Italian horror, and well, the giallos, but also the horror films like the Fulci's and the Babas really, really bother me. <laughs> like, yeah, I, me I, too. I just feel like there's, it's like there's an anything goes quality that mm. that that with you know strangely a certain amount of of impressive production design and makeup effects to back up those crazy visions. When I go into them, I get incredibly scared, no matter what it is, and I end up being less scared after yeah. because yeah. I'm so scared to watch them. <laughs> Like back in college, uh, I had a friend. Uh, she was really into horror, and she loved Fulci, and she loved um, Zombie, especially. And I would not watch it with her; I was too scared to watch it. So she actually sat on me <laughs> and pinned me down and grabbed my head and made me watch Zombie, and it was pretty rough. Yeah. But it's all I'm about atmosphere. It. Yeah, you just yeah. can't you can't pay attention to it's it's not worth it to pay attention <laughs> to what's going on no. in the plot. And I forgot one interesting factoid is that. Uh, Perfume of the Lady in Black is directed by Francesco Barilli, and he was actually one of the main actors in Before the Revolution, the uh, Bertolucci film. Huh. It's just kind of an interesting little factoid. I love giallos, mm -hmm. so and I think I got and I think there's something about them. I have the same kind of anxiety about them. I was kind of like, I'm going to see something I don't want to see, 
but the packaging is so great and, yeah. and the music is so you yeah. know alluring and it is that I kind of will go into them but I do watch them sort of through uh you know through my fingers yeah. <laughs> and have to watch them you know get used to them mm -hmm. so I, I really enjoy them and I, I got interested in them in part uh doing a class in a class about British and Italian horror so maybe I could segue to the the film that I chose the horror of Dracula. Mm -hmm. And um, this came up in this class and this kind of transition between British horror and Italian early horror and detective films. I chose Horror of Dracula. It was hard to choose one. And there were so many different, um, you know, ideas of what might be a technically really engaging film. But I wanted to uh, talk about Dracula because it's so kind of classical in a way as a hammer film that it depends on acting and setting and the interplay between Christopher Lee and uh, and Peter Cushing, my idol, mm -hmm. and that the the film goes along in this kind of rational way, but like a British horror story or a ghost story in in the old house. So it has limitations, but it's also in this beautiful Technicolor. And I really had an emotional connection to the film and that it, and that the film has a kind of sense of grief that happens in it that I think gets put across by good acting and dialogue and uh, and the, the performance parts of it so there's a, a scene in the middle of the film where um, Peter Cushing who plays Dr. Van Helsing as this both heroic but very rational scientific man who is really trying to assist this family who's lost the, the daughter to vampirism, <laughs> to evil, um, that the woman is sort of released from the dead, or she is undead and uh, wandering around, and there's a, a scene where she encounters um, the brother, and they have to stake her, as usual, because you always have to have the stakes, but um, the connection between the brother and the sister and having to kill the sister in order to release her from the vampirism and the fact that it, the brother grieves in front of, grieves in the scene is, is really um, intense. Mm. And I think that it, it gives the film a, an extra layer that I think is often left out of horror films. You know, the idea that people grieve, that someone dies and that there's, an aftermath to the death doesn't usually come up, or I think horror films would be very hard to manage if you know if all the deaths had a whole family mm -hmm. grieving the death. So I, I think it is very effective in that sense. Um, so outside of technical effects, but you know, using acting affect to, to mm -hmm. put over the the horror and and relief from the horror. Yeah. That's, that's it. I like that movie a lot too. And first time I ever saw it was actually um, on a 35 millimeter here at Walter Reed. It was very Aww. exciting, beautiful looking. Um, but it was interesting just to jump off what you're saying about grief. It is a very interesting point. Like you have to, in a certain sense, horror movies are all about death. Mm -hmm. And so, in a sense, they're about grieving, but they have to allied that to make it bearable, right? And it's, mm -hmm. I've always thought that, that a, a lot of those movies that have, um, like more recent ghost movies that have twist endings, that's their way of getting around it. Like The Others, which I think is a great movie with mm -hmm. Nicole Kidman. That entire movie is about grief. It's about the grieving process of this tragedy. But you don't know that's what you're watching till the end. Mm -hmm. So it hits you at the end, but you wouldn't be able to watch that movie at mm -hmm. all if that's what that movie was actually about, a woman who murdered her children. Mm -hmm. Like that just, you wouldn't watch that movie. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't be fun. <laughs> it wouldn't be a horror movie. And The Sixth Sense is, is kind of like that too. Like mm -hmm. if you knew that was what you were watching, it would change your whole experience of, of, of watching it. So it's interesting how horror movies kind of get around grief, sometimes mm -hmm. through plot twists. Yes. Mine is The Fog by John Carpenter. Yay. And uh, <laughs> the reason... Well, obviously, the reasons should be obvious to anyone who watches it. He's one of the great American filmmakers. It's absurd well, that I, he doesn't get more praise. I, yes, I felt like we could not have this show without talking mm -mm. about at least one John mm -mm. Carpenter movie. This is my favorite John Carpenter movie, um, even though, uh, for me, it's like Halloween, The Fog, and The Thing are just like a perfect trilogy. I, li I like a lot of his other films, too, but those are just the ones for me um, in terms of horror. And... 
the fog is an interesting case because I do find it scary. It's scary. It's creepy. It's kind of like a perfectly done little ghost movie. But what's amazing about it is it's just compositionally gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like every shot is amazing. Mm -hmm. Like if you watch the first 10 minutes of that film, there's nothing that's not beautiful. Yeah. And every time I show it to someone for the first time, we think that they, they don't really know much about Carpenter. think they're going to see some like cheap or knockoff of some kind. I say, look, it's a movie about ghost pirates. <laughs> <laughs> They've come back to collect their gold. <laughs> it's That's actually the plot. It's a very simple film, yeah. <laughs> they're, yes, they, they, were, they were leper ghost pirates. <laughs> and they're coming back to Antonio Bay, which is kind of like a fun Bodega Bay riff on yeah. the birds, except, except that it's actually cursed with a very literal explanation this time. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's totally goofy. If you describe that film to anyone, it sounds like the stupidest movie. But the experience of watching it is elegant and precise. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just the way that the camera, it's, it's, wi it's widescreen, it's, it's shot in scope. The way the camera takes in that town, the mm -hmm. way it takes in the water, that, that amazing radio station that Adrian Barbeau yes. works at, every time they cut to that, I just mm -hmm. can't believe how beautiful it is. Yeah, and it's one of those films that um, it really feels like a director just had his big first success and then he kind of just went ahead and did what he wanted to do. He wanted to make an art horror film and, and he did it. And it's, it blows me away every time. I mean, the thing, I think the thing could also qualify as that too because every time I watch that, and it's funny because when I was in high school, one friend of mine, we would always put on the thing and watch maybe like the first 20, 30 minutes of the thing and then leave. Mm -hmm. And then rewatching it again, sort of like with, my cinema eyes, <laughs> you know, like watching it after knowing something more about movies. It just hits you every time, just like, and just how fantastic those effects are oh, and yeah. how all the performances are just like so on. And it's just so many little things that build to this fantastic, scary, terrifying open ending. Like mm -hmm. what the hell is going to happen to those mm -hmm. guys? Yeah, the, well, the thing is remarkable for being like a gooey, gross-out, effects-driven horror movie that actually feels mournful and quiet. Yes. And, I mean, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a strange balance. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that sort of sense of atmosphere and, like, aloneness is present somewhat in Hellraiser, which is my film. Definitely the gooeyness. The gooeyness. Yeah. Those effects are... Um, the gooeyness I just, of the Cinnabons. So. Oh, God. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, like uh, that film, obviously Clive Barker, it was an adaptation of a Clive Barker novel. Uh, there were a lot of problems with it. The main thing being that the filmmakers and the producers really couldn't decide where the hell this thing was set. So half of the people have British accents. Yeah. The other half of people have American accents. And I think the fact that you don't really know where you are and this sort of confusion makes it like even more surreal and just some of the images I'm thinking specifically of it, you know off screen there's the sound of this baby crying and then there's just this white dress gets slowly covered in blood mm -hmm. and then of course the Cenobites the way that they look is amazing it's, it's it, we're crazy. all kind of used to those characters they've they've entered like the pop culture lexicon it's like oh hey it's pinhead like we you know <laughs> like it's a cute but, digestible thing but it's not but no <laughs> the, the, the first, they're not it, it's kind of like Freddy Krueger in a sense that mm -hmm. like he's this very strange and scary surreal character who somehow became like this franchise yeah. figure. Mm -hmm. But um, that's a strange movie. Hellraiser Absolutely. is not just about these these kind of um, freakish S and M weirdos who come through the wall every so often. <laughs> like there, it, it's it's the it's a strange circuitous route to get there. Yes. Like the whole plot about the the wife's lover who comes back because her husband's blood is dripping through mm -hmm. the floor well, and he needs to eat people piece by piece to get his skin back. Because in the book, it was originally semen, oh. which is even, because like, that's like that's how Clive Barker rolls. <laughs> it was like the changes they made for the movie. Like Some of them make sense, and then some of them are just like, whoa, you find you're like, whoa. He should have started out as a baby then if it was <laughs> semen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But yeah, no, and just like, there's like this weird familial betrayal because her lover is her husband's brother, mm -hmm. even though they look, I don't even, again, I don't think they have the matching accents, but who cares? Like, mm -hmm. it's just so... Well, there's also a great queerness to it. I mean, Clive, oh, Clive yeah. Barker, I don't think he was out yet. Mm -hmm. Right. But I mean, his, his, his work was informed by like profound... 
queerness. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And um, I mean, there's that character, that the brother, yes. lover, is very eroticized. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He's like, he's, I think the correct term would be polymorphously perverse. And mm-hmm. it's just like, he's beyond the fact that it's like this erogenous zone that they come from, like literally an erogenous zone where it's like, <laughs> pleasure, pain is pleasure. And like, oh, it's just, and, and what the, I think what that film does with like the male form is u- very unique and um, uh, remarkable. So I always, it, it, it's it's funny the way that things that are mistakes sometimes strengthen or things that maybe that are oversights strengthen and make things stranger and make it wonder all the more wonderful. But that's sort of what filmmaking is. Well, I mean, there's a, the thread of homoeroticism running through horror films yes. uh, through the whole century is fascinating yeah. because, you know, I mean, I don't want to say at the time nobody knew because that's always such a such a you know, ridiculous thing to say. But on a wide, uh, widely, not mm-hmm. everyone talked about those things. But if you right. go back and look, I mean, I was just rewatching um, The Mask of Fu Manchu, which is the mm. craziest <laughs> movie of all time for every possible reason. <laughs> Obviously, it's like the most racist film ever yes. made. Mm-hmm. But on top of it, it is so homoerotic. <laughs> it's if you've seen this, I mean, it be it's beyond comprehension. 1932. It's a pre-code film, so. Right. Um, th- the things that it gets away with are amazing. <laughs> I recommend it. <laughs> Did Clive Barker also make a uh, Candyman? Yeah, I, mean, I thought wrote, so. but no. not directed. Yeah, that's what's interesting. It's like a auteur film by yes. Clive Barker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Candyman is directed by Bernard Rose, who's oh. amazing. Who directed mm-hmm. Paper House, one of my favorite horror movie movies of all time. Mm-hmm. Never been available on DVD. They showed it at Lincoln Center last year, so I get to see it in a print here too. Yeah. <laughs> another okay. plug. Um, but that's a gr- that's a great film, mm-hmm. Paper House. It was almost my choice for childhood terrors because it's actually about childhood. It's about a have you haven't seen? It's about a girl who. It's a British film from 1988. It's about a girl who um, enters her own dream world. She's like 12, so she's like on the cusp of puberty, and she's, so she's starting to have like feelings about boys as they come out in the dreams. And so she draws a picture of a house, like a, just a very simple, almost stick figure type a line drawing. And every time she goes to sleep, she's in the drawing, and in, in her daily life, she can affect it and change something, and then she dreams it, mm-hmm. and it gets scarier and scarier because it's about her relationship with her father, and he shows up as an ogre. It's really scary. Mm. It's great. I highly mm. recommend it. Yeah. I'd love to see that. And I'd like anything that has to do with uh, houses or architecture. And, and I think the way structures and all work in these films is always really fascinating. And I was thinking about uh, Candyman because there's something about Hellraiser that makes me feel like it could be placed in some kind of urban environment or that the characters could be... A, a different race, or I, I, for some, there's something about it that seemed to translate, hmm. and the idea that um, Candyman is this sort of repressed undercurrent in this uh, you know, gentrified mm-hmm. space that kind of bubbles up in this violent way hmm. was making me think that Clive Barker was also the the director of it. Mm-hmm. But this paper house sounds like it would also be really fascinating, just the idea that the house can be drawn and redrawn. and The set design is really cool. It's very simple. It goes along with it, but the house, the structure looks like a child's drawing. Right. Um, and then she keeps changing things inside the house. Mm-hmm. I will let you discover it, okay. and a lot of listeners. It's, <laughs> if you can fi- I think you can only watch it on like a foreign import, though, or maybe, maybe YouTube at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so suckers who missed it here last year yeah. sorry <laughs> <laughs> you blew it <laughs> but yeah i guess now we can transition to films that scare or unsettle us now but michael you had a very interesting one that i no one here had heard of before so this it, mine is called uh, la cabina it's a 1972 spanish short made for television so it's likely that a lot of people listening haven't seen it or even maybe heard of it I first saw it in 2009 a film critic friend of mine recommended it to me it sounded innocuous <laughs> as described <laughs> and it plays that way for a little while but it truly upset me and um can you describe it Br- get, you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> I kind of think <laughs> try <laughs> I'm gonna try I do want to try not to spoil it a bit. Cause it I is do on th- YouTube, too. It's you on YouTube, and everyone here can watch it. It's 35 minutes or so. I rewatched it last night, even though I told myself I'd never watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a film about um, a middle-aged man. Um, he sends his son off to school one morning, and he sees this 
bright red telephone booth in the middle of a very public park. And um, he goes into the booth. He's going to make a phone call. We don't know who to. Um, and then the door closes, and he can't get out. And it escalates from there. And what it really does seem like, um, as Margaret uh, pointed out to me earlier, it's kind of like a Jacques Tati movie gone terribly wrong. <laughs> Um, and it, play, it does play like that for a while, and there is some hilarity to it because um, a lot of people try to help him in, in kind of self-interested ways, but they try to help him out. Nobody can break through the glass. Nobody can open the door. All different types of people try to help, but it just seems like he can't get out. And it just, yeah, it escalates from there. I don't want to give away too much, but I find it to be incredibly disturbing on many levels, I think it was it was made in the '70s. It's uh, in Spain. It's considered a, a film about the Franco dictatorship, uh, about people kind of disappearing in plain sight, and it's very much about governmental systems and how they seem like they're there to protect you, but they're definitely definitely not mm -hmm. a lot of the time. It's a movie that kind of just leaves me shaking, mm -hmm. without spoiling too much about what happens. And yeah. it's also such a perfect short film. Yeah. Perfectly structured, perfectly conceived, that it, I, I almost can't believe everyone doesn't know about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of like a master class in short filmmaking, like what it does and even just, you know, compositionally and the fact that it can have like flashbacks to earlier in the film and they feel, you know, they really are so functional and like emotive and powerful. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's truly wonderful. So even if you don't have these anxieties, you should check it out, and maybe you will. I maybe think, you'll develop them. I think, <laughs> I think it plays on a lot of different anxieties. Yes, with, with this With this extremely simple premise, it mm -hmm. just contains multitudes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are so many ideas in there. Also, what's fascinating is that the protagonist, he never speaks. You, like, you, you don't get shots from inside the booth at any point. Once right. he's in there, you see it from outside. So you never hear him talk once he's inside the booth Right, it's like all. soundproofed. Completely soundproofed, and that's so disturbing as well. Um, mm -hmm. It just gets increasingly despairing, I'd say, and, and then a little grand guignol at the end, um, yeah. unexpectedly, because there's a lot of weird tonal shifts. Like you, you really can see this as being a comedy for a great part of it, mm -hmm. yeah. and then it just stops being a comedy. Mm -hmm. And um, I did also think of the red, the red balloon in terms yeah. of perfect shorts, where there is. Um, so much is expressed through a color, yes. the color red in this case. It's yeah. kind of like the, the nightmare version of that. Even though the red balloon itself is kind of scary. I'll just throw that <laughs> out there. Because what happens to that kid at the end of the red balloon? It's not good. Where is he going up in the sky? Big questions. <laughs> but Margaret, what was um, you? Well, I wanted to preface this by saying that I actually, I don't like being scared, you know, by scary movies. I know most people who I talk to who love horror films say they love being scared. And I don't love being scared, actually. I don't get any pleasure out of that. It's almost like people who, like, love, like, really, really spicy food. <laughs> like, I love spicy food, too, but at a certain point, it's just pain. You're just feeling pain. You're not, you know, tasting it or anything. So often if, if I think I'm going to be scared, really scared by film, I won't watch it. Like, <laughs> but I've become like inured to, you know, gore and scares and things. So I actually can watch a lot of films that are considered very scary. But I get scared off if I think it's going to really going to get me. So this was a hard one for me. So I actually picked this film, The Entity, which mm -hmm. still it scares me, but more so it fills me with dread, like a deep dread. And it is a super extra problematic film. I know that. <laughs> but I also really love it. I really like this film a lot. Well, can you describe? Sure. Yeah. It's based on a real woman and her accounts. She's basically repeatedly attacked and raped by a poltergeist. Mm -hmm. And the rape scenes are horrific. You know, I, I mean, I, they're they're. Some people could argue that they're exploitative. I don't know. I, I think they're just very scary, very horrific scenes. But the film itself, I think, is really good. It stars Barbara Hershey, and she is just phenomenal in it. She puts on a great performance. And part of what is scary or dreadful about it is all the aftermath of these attacks. The people who don't take her seriously, the men who won't believe her, the way that she's treated by psychologists. She's She goes to, unfortunately... She goes to a university for therapy because it's free. 
And so she's met with a crew of Freudians, mm -hmm. <laughs> like super Freudians, and they just don't approach her in the right way at all. And finally, you get in the last like third section of the film, which is my favorite, which is when it gets more science fiction, is she meets up with these paranormalists who finally take her seriously and kind of take her under their wing. But there are a lot of split diopter shots in it that are really cool. And really just Barbara Hershey is just so great in it. I think she's a very realistic character. And I think it might have to do with the fact that it's based on a real woman. So they incorporated the details of her life into it and certain details that you just don't see in other films. Like she has three children by different fathers. She has a son who's like an adult son who's like part Hispanic mm -hmm. and he's just like a great son. She's a single mom. She doesn't have much money. And it's just her character is fleshed out really well, I think. It's it's really all about Barbara Hershey, and it's very well made. It's directed by Sidney J. Fury, who wasn't really a horror director. Yeah, and it also <laughs> has that great soundtrack, or yes, when the entity yes. comes around. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really good uh, music, too. Yeah, I have the same thing. It's kind of like I, I love the movie, but when I'm watching it, I'm kind of like, this isn't all right. And if, when I recommend it to other people, they judge. Kind of, yeah, 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 I get judged. Kind of like, really? Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you like about it? I was like, yeah. you know. But um, I came to that film, I think I saw it here at a screening. There's a, I think it's 35 millimeter short film that's made uh, do you remember? It's, yeah, Peter Tchaikovsky. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I've and I've seen that. It's it's a it's an avant garde kind of footage film. I've yeah. seen that, but I haven't seen the entity. Uh, oh yeah, so I, I saw well, that. I put and, off and it watching was it for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I clearly I was like, this is going to be a very disturbing film. And usually, anyone talks about it, they're like, nah, you yeah, you know. <laughs> and actually, I ended up just watching it by accident on this bizarre TV Roku channel mm -hmm. that just streams things, and you tune into them, you know, whenever what's on and then and then I just got sucked sucked in mm -hmm. sucked into it yeah I, I think it's a movie that still frightens me when I you know even when I'm watching it I'm kind of like oh I'm a little uncomfortable watching it I think also because other her family gets affected by mm -hmm. it and yeah when she runs to her friend it the entity kind of follows her you know it's uh, it's the things that you would do to escape you can't really can't. escape. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and so it's very rough in that way. Should I segue yeah, into sure. the, <laughs> um, the one that I chose? Because I have the same feeling. It's like I don't really like horror films, mm -hmm. even though I have a horror blog. <laughs> and I <laughs> and it's all, and it's been a long uphill, well, not uphill, like sort of a pleasant struggle trying to get myself to watch horror films. So I have to really have them vetted for contemporary <laughs> films <laughs> and uh, things like The Entity and... And some of the other films that are going to come up, I would have avoided unless I had an entree into it. And so the film that I chose as my one that scares me as an adult is The Vanishing, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> which I, you know, I I was kind of like, can I prepare to talk about it by <laughs> watching some of it? And then I was just like, no. <laughs> I'm not. I'm going to read the description of it, and that's it, because I can't go there. And um, to describe it, it's made by Slusier um, mm -hmm. in 19... Again, looking at my notes, 1988, a uh, Dutch film. I always think of it whenever I'm on a road trip of any kind of... Uh, in any extent, because it's a couple who are on a trip. They kind of get stuck in a tunnel, and the woman tells a story about having a dream about being in a golden egg. Mm -hmm. They kind of get separated in this tunnel, but eventually they get back together, they continue on their trip, and they stop at a, uh, a rest stop, and she disappears. And the rest of the film is the husband trying to figure out what happened to her, in a sense. But there's also a, another track to the film about the kidnapper who you're introduced to right away, so that's not really a spoiler. And his thoughts and machinations before they kind of connect at this spot. I don't know if there's a way to describe the film without spoiling it, but it was a film that the whole film is stressful. It's mm -hmm. not really scary, but the, the denouement is 
is terrifying and it's sad and and it's something that's sad about the film and unrelieved mm. and it's a good film but it's it was like cannot be unseen but not like you know fulci level but just like <laughs> i can't not i can't get this out of my mind and i am both afraid about what happens but overall this sense of disturbance about what's outside and what's around us and it, it was very destabilizing like very felt very shaky about it yeah i mean i like i just got a chill hearing you talk about it it's a movie that like an actual one um it's a movie that upsets me so badly to think about maybe even in retrospect more more so than watching it mm -hmm. um it's one of those movies where if you you think about what it's about it's yeah, it's more chilling than than um, you know sitting through it. I I don't want to sit through it again because it's probably more painful knowing what happens. But yeah, no, it, my my uh, my husband's never seen it, and it's on Criterion. And so you know, well, we should watch the we should watch the Vanishing. Is that good? I said, yeah, that's good. But I will not watch that with you. <laughs> um, and it's not just because. I don't want to go through it again. It's because I don't want to watch it with him because mm -hmm. I love him. And I, and, I don't, and, I, and I also don't mean I don't want to put someone I love through that. Mm -hmm. What I mean is that movie is very much about love mm -hmm. and about people who love each other and what people will go through because of that love. And it's very disturbing. Like The, the central idea of that film is, is, is brilliant. It's a brilliant idea, actually. The lengths people go to know something about someone else. Like I want to get into the mind of someone else, mm -hmm. the person that I love. If only I know what's in their mind. It's a brilliant idea. I, I give the director a lot of credit, but I'm not doing it again. <laughs> and I think it, and it's also a lot about aloneness. I watched it alone, and it was a film that I left feeling alone. Mm -hmm. Complete. I, I don't know what it would have been like to see it in a theater with other people, where I, but it's just it's isolating in a way that's well, what that's saying, yeah. what's amazing about it. If you think of it as a love story, it's a very, very, very sad yeah. one because it's ultimately about we're all ultimately alone. That's mm -hmm. about as scary as it gets. Yeah. Should I do mine? Mm -hmm. Please, mm -hmm. yes. right. save us. No help. <laughs> well, I don't know if this is going to help because <laughs> you brought it, you mentioned Fulci yeah. and how <laughs> you have this feeling with his films that they cannot be unseen. <laughs> um, and I, I should say, I should mention that if you're in New York, you should definitely check out anthology series where they're oh, doing yeah. it all yeah. a yes. bunch of Fulci movies, including the one that I'm about to name, which scares me and settles me. I rewatched it again last night. It totally unsettled me. The Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this movie? It starts off with an angry mob in 1927 coming to this hotel and uh, whipping a, an artist to death, crucifying him to a basement wall, and then throwing acid on his face. Yeah. <laughs> That's just like the first five minutes. <laughs> And again, it, it takes a really long time for this angry mob to do any of this, so it's super gross to watch. And then um, it flashes forward to late 70s, early 80s, and um, it's about this woman who's inherited this hotel, and she's trying to sort of make it look good again, rent it out, make a little money off of it. She's just come from doing stuff in New York, didn't really make it there, so she's trying to make it in this backwater, and... Um, it's actually a gateway to hell, <laughs> actually. So um, there's so much death in this, and the way people die leaves them horribly disfigured, and then they come back from the dead horribly <laughs> disfigured. There's also these great POV shots, um, handheld stuff. There's lots of eyeball popping out stuff. <laughs> there's probably one of my favorite shots in all of cinema when the woman who owns the hotel, she sort of, teams up with this local doctor. They run out of the hotel and drive away, and then all the lights go on in the hotel, and these, these things start walking by the windows, and you don't know what they are. It's like so, it's like, oh, it gives me a chill just now to just think, it's like so good. And then there's also a great moment, I won't, I won't spoil it too much, where someone has a gun, they run out of ammo, and then they pick up the gun again, they start shooting it, and it has ammo in it again, mm -hmm. but, they've crossed into hell and they don't realize that they've crossed into hell. <laughs> like, it's just like the <laughs> situation. Because at first you're like, oh, it's just a dumb horror movie thing. No, they're actually in hell. So, and then uh, the final image of the film is just so, I, it reminded, it reminds me of genocide. Like, it's it's really like these, these dead bodies, naked, lying in this like gray, nothing space. And it's just so terrifying. Yeah, I don't know, that guy. Bravo, Fulci. You're, yeah. you're, 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 you're fucking sick master. Yeah. Let me bless you.
<laughs> oh, and then also the scene that I still cannot watch, I can never watch, there's a scene where somebody gets their face eaten by a bunch of tarantulas. <laughs> and some of the tar- and then they're like real tarantulas mixed in with these very fake tarantulas. But nevertheless, like I I I sort of got over my fear of spiders, but then this just totally reactivates <laughs> it and I cannot watch it. So some of those spiders are really fake. Oh, they're the <laughs> fakest. I mean. They're the fakest, but they're like, they're still, they're, those are the ones doing the worst stuff. They're just like, like squeezing out the eyeballs again and just like tearing out, and like tearing yeah. out tongues and stuff. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the length. It's the length. Of those things. That's yes. the thing about Because that scene lasts like, Fulci. yeah, it yeah. lasts like mm-hmm. two and a half minutes of these spiders. Mm-hmm. Like, blah, blah, blah. You can tell he just used every possible take or oh, shot. Yeah. Like, it doesn't yeah. matter if it was a good take no. or a bad take. And We're going to put it all in here. It's going to take like five minutes. But you want to see a guy's yeah. face get ripped off by spiders. So. And it's also, and it's not diegetic sound at all. It's like this squeaking wheel noise. Well, mixed nothing, with like, nothing in those movies are diegetic right, sound. Right, right, exactly. But this is like completely, this is like this completely made up soundscape where it's like grinding bone noise. Yeah. And then also like a squeaking wheel that's like really irritating. And then also, and then again, then it gets to like the crunching. And then like it's all these different mm-hmm. noises. And it's like, it again, it's this totally surreal, horrifying thing that, I just I, like my my hands are right there. Is that the one with the acidic ooze? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I was thinking about Thick. that the other day. Yeah, <laughs> that was scary. Yes, that it's, was it's, also... that remains scary. That it's like this, you know, and it's that it's approaching, approaching, <sighs> and yeah. It's actually like... the, that's a good example of a film where I read about it a lot before I saw it, mm-hmm. and I don't think there's anything the mm-hmm. other genre that's like that, right? Mm-hmm. Where I actually growing up whether they were horror books and now obviously it's online but horror movies sometimes if they're supposed to be gory ones i will kind of read ahead of time to see what's in them before i see them because i have to prepare myself or maybe i won't see them ever but i kind of want to know with strange curiosity Mm -hmm. but i think that that's an interesting thing about horror movies and that was also the case growing up looking at video box covers in the video store like it was very important to me to know what these things were and know what the dangers were and then maybe just completely stay away from them Yeah. yeah Because I think that's what sort of like binds all four of our films together is that it's like this deep unknown Mm -hmm. that gore is one thing. Like gore is a tangible thing. It's like, okay, I see this thing happening. But these deeper, more unsettling things that sort of arise that you can't foresee, that shock you, that you aren't expecting, that take this whole left turn, like it's, that's what's actually scary. Well, that that, makes me wonder, just because both of you, um, Margaret and Ina, said that you don't like watching horror movies, which is really funny <laughs> to say in the third part of this podcast. Um, but I'm just wondering what that means, though. Are you? What is it that you're staying away from? Is it what kind of fear are you trying to avoid? Embarrassing, like just uh, it's embarrassing. Like jump scares, jump scares get me, yeah. and then I get angry immediately after with myself <laughs> for like j- being, you know, subject to the to the jump scares. So more of newer newer films i mm-hmm. i just avoid almost at all costs um if it was made in the 70s and i already love films from the 70s the effects are like fake enough that i can kind of get through it and um this things like that i mean I, I i just have a insatiable like desire to see things that i'm not supposed to see mm-hmm. or you know that you don't normally see and that's part of what draws me to the films more so than being scared you know I don't, I don't get excited about getting scared well I don't like violence actually yeah. so depictions of violence I struggle with but it started out with a fear of being psychologically manipulated or frightened and I think because my parents were being so protective about mm-hmm. the horror that it actually took on more, it was much more frightening than anything that was actually seen. So like in the exorcist years, listening to my brothers talk about it, you know, the idea of fainting and people freaking out. I read the book, but was so affected by that, that I was immobilized really for a while, but I couldn't tell my parents what was going on. Um, so I think that's where it started. And But that fear has gone away a little bit, but seeing depictions of violence, I think is the thing that I shy away from but I got interested in horror in order to get over that that fear because in especially after my father died I was kind of you know it it seemed to be a place to go to be able to understand Mm -hmm. death and to share an experience 
and it was also a part of my film knowledge that was lacking, but I was very curious about. Mm -hmm. Like I also had, I was kind of like, how, you know, I can't let this get the better of me. Mm -hmm. It's easier with other people. When you watch with other people, it can be fun when you're all scared. Mm -hmm. It's not fun when you're scared and the person you're with is not scared. Then it can be like (laughs) embarrassing. (laughs) But um, it's fun in a group and everyone's like screaming and jumping. And it's, it's, it is funny also the things that some people find really fun that other people don't. Like I, one of the things I, um, I wanted to mention was just my complete inability to watch those Final Destination movies. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I, that, tru- that truly bothers me. And if I tell that to most people, they look at me like, what are you talking about? Those things are just completely nuts. They're fun. They're completely over the top. They're like these Rube Goldberg contraptions. You know, the idea of them is that you've cheated death and death is going to come get you, but he comes to get you by these incredibly labyrinthine, ridiculous setups that are, you know, like, you know, you'll you'll drop a, an ice cube and the ice cube will <laughs> turn to water and someone will slip on it, but that won't kill them. They'll, like, fall on a knife that flies across the room that hits the, <laughs> that hits the plug and then sparks fly. It's just, and then the person, the way you didn't expect it to happen, it happens. However, the central idea of those films is that people die of accidents, mm-hmm. and I can't watch that. Because I think of it every day. <laughs> I think of like that's what I'm, that's what I fear the most of myself and people I love. So I get no pleasure out of that, even though they're goofy and over the top. And some of the things that I, I saw the first one, and then I saw parts of the third one, and some of the things that I've seen it never will get out of my head. It's it's one of those like things you can't unsee because it's just too. Even though it's, though it's ridiculous and it's almost a comedy, it's too close to how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, I remember. Um, I was at South by Southwest, I think in 2006, and they had these like little bumpers that would play at the Alamo Draft House I was at. And because it was, this was back when movies were actually really important at South by Southwest, so it was like really hard to get in, so you'd have to show up super early. So I was there for like 20 minutes, and I kept seeing like the same bumpers over and over and over again. And one of them was of this kaiju movie. Clearly, they thought this was supposed to be funny, but it really upset me. And then I overheard this other woman saying, like, this is actually really upsetting, (laughs) Um, where it's like this guy gets abducted by aliens and then he accidentally gets turned into like a trash monster and then he can't get turned back. And so he's just (laughs) stuck as a fucking trash monster. And it's so upsetting. It's like because this one alien was like, messing around with his control mm. panel like it's like it's like uh, and it's like it's like this idea that you're stuck at something wrong forever just like completely freaked me out and it's and then, then I had to watch it like eight times because I was <laughs> waiting for this other movie to start and thank you woman also in the crowd that I overheard say like this is upsetting because I was like I am I just being too sensitive about this but no, no. it's just yeah it's just weird uh, yeah some I think we're all afraid of like fate. Yeah, you know, the, the being stuck in certain things, being trapped in certain things, yeah. and being fated that just no way out. Right. Well, but, you were yeah. also you were also afraid of uh, um, Event Horizon. You oh mentioned. my God! Yeah. Be- which is an ac- again accidentally <laughs> yeah. opening the port of the hell. Yes, which is really a fear of the unknown. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and it's like you can't do anything about it. You yeah. know, you're not going to like get rid of hell. You know, no. in the film, you know, it's like <laughs> that's it. Mm-hmm. You're just screwed. Yeah. Like, and also just being alone. Carnival of Souls was going to be yes. the other film that I was thinking about and, and that this character is kind of trapped. Well, first of all, that a woman is alone and uh-huh. and what happens, you know, being kind of haunted mm-hmm. and being unseen, even though you're in a public place and yeah. that, that separation. And is it like, is this in my mind or is it not? I think it also takes in a little bit of the grief thing or something, you know, it's a uh, unresolved yeah. Uh, grief. Yeah. I think the effects of that movie are actually really excellent. Yeah. Where yeah. the, pe- you know, so it's like these windows that open and then there are these like faceless people sort of confronting her with this mm-hmm. thing, but she doesn't know what she's being confronted with. It's just terror. That's like a, such a wonderful image. And they Effective. play a lot with the speed of the film. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and um, especially sort of speeding it up and the kind of documentary sort of look to it oh yeah like very the, yeah like the opening is like the opening could be like a documentary about stupid teenagers yeah, yeah. and, then, <laughs> and I, I think he made uh what are those films uh, like educational films and mm-hmm. the director herc harvey so that really shows in those those shots those initial shots yeah 
Well, now that we're all sufficiently creeped out. <laughs> <laughs> Before we close, as we always do, could we each go around and say one film we saw recently that we liked? It can be wonderful and life-affirming, <laughs> full of sun. <laughs> um, mine is not. <laughs> I'm just going to keep in with the theme of the show. Sure. I just saw Horror Hotel for the first time, which is a really bad title for a pretty good B British horror movie set in New England from 1960, the great year of horror movies. It is a, it's it's a kind of like your basic young grad students working on her thesis. <laughs> she goes to a small Massachusetts town to investigate witchcraft because they, they call they don't call the town salem for some reason they call it something else it was some copyrighted. ridiculous made up name um and she goes to an inn so it's not really a hotel it's an inn and she's basically beset by satanists mm. um, does it have another name yeah. it does have another yeah, name like I've city of the walking dead or something, something like, like that. that yeah it's great it's, good. it's really funny because it's not a city it's not a hotel so ni neither of the titles work right <laughs> um i forget what the other yeah it's something like that but yeah hor it, it was good it, it was it has some really great scares it, it's just really well shot some really great compositions it's spooky uh, there's a really great funny cut from a knife that's going into someone into a birthday cake it's fun yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm not finished yet but i've been over the Weeks and months, actually, I've been slowly making my way through Cleopatra. Oh, yay! <laughs> the 63. Yeah, one. it's so long. <laughs> but um, I have a projector at my apartment, and I have a very big screen, and it's just, like, made for Cleopatra, and I love, I love, I'm a sucker for, you know, ancient Egyptian stuff and yeah. films and the set design and the costumes and everything, but... It's also like a very talky <laughs> film, so I'll watch maybe an hour of it and then fall asleep, and then a week or two later I'll like pull down the screen, you know, and I'll watch. So just the other night I watched, um, I watched more of part two. <laughs> oh, and there was one part in it. There's a cut. I mean, the continuity is just totally off, and it's just hilarious. Where she bursts through like a a curtain, and she has a totally different outfit on totally different like she had on a headdress before she had a different clothes different colors and it was just in the matter of like a second of like bursting through a curtain <laughs> so i'll to be continued cleopatra i saw tony erdman the other day which was was really great to see and i loved it but it, but it was baffling as well in some ways i was um and then I saw, Michael, one of your favorite films, Dressed to Kill. Oh. Oh. Um, <laughs> Almost yes. talked about. Yes. No, it was, um, yeah, it was just really appreciating how it's made. And then also having seen De Palma, knowing all this stuff about his own family and how he was that kid in a certain respect. And then also, uh, you know, what he did to sort of like, confront his father about this affair he was having on his mother and um i just love the ending which is sort of like carrie but also gr it's great in its own way mm -hmm. and so i just love the scene at the restaurant where she's explaining to the kid like what it means to have a gender reassignment surgery and just this woman who's just like oh <laughs> making this horrible face and it's like and i and i would like to believe that that is the face of conservative America and not a surrogate for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> and just a quick little note about that is that <laughs> because that was a that movie is so beautifully widescreen yes. um, and so many of the jokes and shocks are in the corners of the frame mm -hmm. when that movie was on videotape which I watched growing up on VHS that was cut out Oh, because of the pan and scan, it was she was oh. that woman was cropped out, so you didn't see the actual joke. Interesting. So. Yeah, I don't Got know if you've ever seen scan. that. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. This was spectacular. You've been listening to the Film Comment Podcast, produced by Violet Luca and Nicholas Rapold. The music is Frankie Teardrop by Suicide, R.I.P. Alan Vega. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. 
Film Comet is a bi-monthly magazine published by the Film Society of Lincoln Center since 1962. Film Comet has featured in-depth reviews, critical analysis, and feature coverage of mainstream art house and avant-garde filmmaking from around the world. Visit us online at filmcomet.com slash subscribe to purchase a digital or print subscription to the magazine. Film Comet, at the heart of film culture for over 50 years. Bro.